how we make a mandarin orange mead. For a while, people have been asking us to make an orange mead or an orange wine, and I actually made an orange wine years ago, and it was absolutely vile. <laughs> it was just totally disgusting, one of the very few brews that I've actually dumped out. Then there's the jam, or jam, or however you want to pronounce it, J Joe's Ancient Orange Mead, and I've never made that, on purpose mostly, because everybody's made it. And I don't like to just do the same thing that everybody else has done. We want to do something different. Show you, you know, new ways of doing things, different things. Also, neither one of us is named Joe. Yeah, so it'd be Bayum, Dayum, Dayum. Dayum. Yeah, I mean, you know, it just it, it gets a little <laughs> bit weird. And I know that oranges can be a little bit astringent when fermented and they can take a really long time. So we decided Let's do mandarins instead, because I actually really love mandarins. I think they're wonderful. Plus, I wanted to do something a little bit different. Um, we're going to, well, let me show you. So, we have our fermenter. We have our mandarin. Now, a regular orange has a very thick peel and a thick pith underneath that peel. That's difficult to separate, so you usually zest those. Well, a mandarin is great, because look at this. I could just peel right off that peel, and that's what we want just the peel. Now I am getting a tiny bit of pith. Good luck getting that off. I mean, why bother? But it's so minimal that it really shouldn't be an issue. And I've been told by a lot of people that they've been putting pith of oranges and whatever in their brews and it didn't even change anything. I've never actually tested that. Someday maybe we will. But for today, I'm just going to take the peel of mandarin oranges. How many mandarin oranges? 13. That's right. 13 mandarin orange peels are going to go into this brew. And don't worry, I have plans for the fruit too. Talk about that soon. And through the magic of television, we now have the peels of 12 mandarin oranges, because one's in there, and 13 fruits right there. What are we going to do with the fruits, Derica? We're going to freeze them. And they're going to get used in this mead later. But for now, we're going to put these away. I'll be right back. All right, so we have fermenter, peels. I'm just going to put all the peels right into the fermenter. And no, I'm not breaking them up too much because it doesn't really matter. The, uh, the peels have all of the essential oils, okay? They're the things that are going to add most of the flavor for this brew. And that's important to understand. The fruit itself has the sugars and things like that. And we're going to use that later. But for now, I actually want to extract this. Think like limoncello, okay? We did a video on that. And it extracts all the oils and the flavors from the peel into the vodka, neutral spirit of your choice, and adds the flavor that way. So this should have a lovely complexity of flavors. It's also a really neat way to avoid pectic haze, because we're not actually fermenting orange. We're fermenting the orange essence. So I'm curious. And if we get pectic haze, we'll deal with that later. But for now, I don't think it's going to be an issue. Next up, we want to measure out our honey. And, you know, in keeping with the theme, what kind of honey are we going to be using? Orange blossom honey from Bevy's Bees. And I want to use, you know, we're going to go with the standards on this one, three pounds of honey. All right, I have it all teared out, ready to go using a wide mouth jar so I don't even need a funnel this time. I'm just going to pour in three pounds. All right, so we have the peels, we got honey, but now we want to start mixing this up. So I want to add some water, probably about half to two-thirds of the way up. You just pour some water in there for me. A little bit more, a little bit more. What about there? The reason I don't want to fill it all the way to mix is because it makes it a lot harder to mix. So now we can actually get this mixed. If you use a fermenter where you can put the lid on and reliably know it won't leak, perfectly fine to just pick it up and shake it. This one, I don't trust that, so that's why I'm not doing it that way. The peels may actually make it harder to mix. I, I'm not sure about that, so we'll find out. I normally would put something like that in afterwards. If nothing else, I'm bruising those peels, letting out more of their essential oils. That's our story and we're sticking to it. The water is a little warm, about blood temperature. I like to say that because most of us have a similar blood temperature, whereas room temperature may vary. If your blood temperature varies that much, Seek professional help. Already, the smell of the mandarin oranges and the honey together is really working for me. I think this is going to be nice. I like it. So let's get a little bit more water in there. Go right about there. Perfect. Okay, now I have the rest of the water in, so I can just give this a good stir and uh, hopefully get all the honey off the bottom. The whole problem, if I don't get all the honey off, is I won't get an accurate original gravity, which isn't the end of the world, but it's kind of like it'll confuse you if you checked it in a couple days and it was higher. You might be like, what the heck? 
The yeast will get to it. It just might take them a little bit longer to do. We actually did a video showing that. So I'm not worried about that aspect of it. Um, I just want to make sure that I get an accurate original reading. And I can see that there's still some honey here. Yeah. So give me a minute. I'll be back. One thing I want to point out, everything that we're using here, the spoon, the jar, we actually scrubbed all of those oranges. Well, Derica scrubbed them. I peeled them, but Derica scrubbed everything. Everything here has been sanitized in... The red bucket of sanitization! Which is literally a big red bucket filled with sanitizer fluid and water mixed as per the manufacturer's suggested directions. One more thing that I want to add to this, actually two more things that I want to add to this, is a little bit of yeast nutrient. I am using Fermaid O. We actually like Fermaid O. It's nice and simple, um, nothing too complex about it, and it doesn't have anything that I really don't want to put in my body. Um, we're using two grams in a little bit of water, and I'm just going to put that in. It's been sitting for a few minutes, so it dissolves really nice and easy. The tiny whisk is optional, but really, really awesome. And I'm just going to give that a little bit of a mix through. It's not it'll get in. It's not really necessary to totally mix that up. And at this point, I want to take a gravity reading, okay? This will be our original gravity. For that, I'm just going to use a hydrometer, turkey baster, the simple way. I'm expecting something like a 1.105-ish, maybe, yeah, right around there, maybe a little bit higher, simply because the peels do take up a little bit of space. All right, it's reading 1.132. That's a little higher than I'm comfortable with for this, so there's one very simple solution. I'm gonna put this back in. We're gonna add a little water. The main reason why that would happen is because these peels take up quite a bit of space that would normally be reserved for water when you're making a mead. So the usual 0 0.035 per pound for honey doesn't really apply here because we have less than a gallon, okay? So you wanna be careful with that and it's something to watch out for. And that's a U.S. gallon. Yes, we use U.S. gallons on this show because do I sound like I'm from the U.K.? And now, another reading. I am using a yeast that is tolerant to 18%, but I happen to know that keeping it a little bit lower than the 1.130 number makes it easier on your yeast. So we're less likely to have a stall, less likely to have off flavors, less likely to have all sorts of problems. That little bit of dilution might not drop it all the way down to the range I want, but it'll get it closer, and that's... That's what we're really looking for. Dropped it to 1.120. I'm good with that. That works for me. Because everything was sanitized, I am going to pour this right back in. Whoops. Not the hydrometer, though. We don't really want to put the hydrometer in there. So you want to keep your finger on that when you're putting it in. Go wash my hands. In addition to the orange that we have, the peels themselves aren't really going to add a lot of astringency or a tannic effect. I like to have a little bit of mouthfeel. I don't want this to taste watery, so I want to really know what's there. So we're going to be using wine tannin today. Now, if you don't want to use wine tannin, it's literally just made from dried chestnuts. If you don't want to use that, you feel free to add a cup of strong black tea. No problem. It'll do much the same thing, really. We've had many viewers ask if they could use a flavored tea rather than just a pure black tea, and normally we say no because it's there for the tannins, not for the flavor. However, in this particular case, if you want to use a flavored tea such as Earl Grey, which is flavored with bergamot, which is a citrus flavor, that would be perfectly appropriate in this particular application. Might actually complement it nicely. I'm using a half teaspoon of the powdered wine tannin and basically just dump that in and mix it through. Once we have that added, all that's left is the yeast. And we are using Red Star Premier Blanc. Why are we using Premier Blanc, babe? Because of its fruity esters. It actually works really well for white wines and for fruits, meads, melomels, that sort of thing. It seems like a good all-arounder. Um, my understanding, and I could be wrong, but my understanding is that it's actually EC1118. It's the same strain. They just call it uh, Premier Blanc. Now, you noticed I had to use scissors to open it, right? I really wish they would make their packets able to be torn open. They don't. They haven't listened to me yet. It's been a couple years. I don't expect them to, so I guess I'll just have to stop ranting about it. But I am going to use a whole packet in this. And hold on just a second. I'm going to just dump it right in. Some people will say, why are you in know, a whole packet? Well, first, thwack your packet, because you want to get all those yeasties out of there. I mean, you know, you're, you paid for them, so get them in there. And I'm not even kidding. I can feel granules in that packet. So you want to get them all out. And I know some people will say that it seems like a waste to use a whole packet of yeast. Here's my theory on that. We've used the fifth of a packet because it does five gallons. We've used half a packet. We've done all these things. I feel personally that most of the time when we've had the cleanest fermentations that started up the quickest and just went the smoothest, it was when we used a whole packet. So we just use a whole packet. Does it cost maybe a little bit more to make it? 
yeah, but in the long run, I think making a cleaner, better tasting fermentation is probably a great thing in exchange for that. When you put your yeast in, be really careful because it sticks to everything, including the spoon that she's mixing it with. It's just stuck all over the place. You can just like shake it around a little bit and get it off there. It'll stick to the sides of the jar and all that kind of stuff. And I want to just try to get as much of those orange peels under the liquid as possible. This is going to be one of those brews that you want to give it a shake every day. Make sure those orange peels stay wet. Are there ways you, that we could have contained them? Sure, but this is not a very big vessel, so I didn't want to lose any more space. We've already given up probably a tenth to a fifteenth of that space uh, to the uh, orange peels themselves. And last but not least, lid and airlock. You want to use an airlock. Trust me, if you just lid this, just put a cap on it, it's going to blow up. And if you just leave the cap loose, well, I don't know, you're taking some risks. Really, use the airlock. It's, it's the best way to go. And the most important thing is take notes. On here, I have the date, I have the name of the mead, and I have all of the ingredients listed, which are coincidentally also listed in the description below. So I'm just going to put a piece of masking tape on this, stick it on the fermenter, and we're going to put this away in the fermentation station until the airlock starts to slow down, and we'll see you then. All right, so it's been 22 days, and as you can see, airlock activity has slowed down a lot, which is kind of an indicator of it might be time to start taking some readings. We're going to look inside. Give it a smell. It smells like oranges. Some of the peels have turned a little bit like a darker color. They're still orangey, but they're a little darker. But it's getting to that point where you might want to rack it soon. So we want to just make sure that this is really done before we actually do that. Got a nice color. Oh, yeah. It's clearing out a little bit. I had a feeling it was dry already. We started out at 1.120, and it is already at, eh, it's not quite dry. 1.006. Yeah, let me verify that. Two, four, six. 1.006. So this is very, very close to being done, if not actually done, because there could be a little bit more going on in here than we think. Let me take a note on that. But as we like to do, we're going to wait a week, take another reading, and see where it's at. It may actually be finished. It might not. We will find out in a week. So it's been exactly six days, and this was at 1.006. So it's time for a second reading. See where it's at. See if it's done. See if it's time to move on. 1.006. Okay. So some inferences can be made from this. Did it stall? Possibly. Possibly. But it's okay, because we are going to rack this today. We are going to put it into secondary conditioning, secondary or conditioning phase. And we're going to move on, because it is not fermenting anymore. Now, what we do next may actually kick off fermentation, but it's going to be under airlock, so it's all okay. Okay, so now we have our sample, and we're going to be racking this, but we're going to rack it this is going to sound weird, into a little Big Mouth Bubbler, which is actually larger than this. But that's because of what's going to be coming up. We might have mentioned it already, but in case we didn't, it's what's coming. And I'm going to pour this directly into the little Big Mouth Bubbler. I poured the sample right in here, because if I pour it into there, I could disturb all the leaves and stuff, and we don't want that in our finished product. Racking! The way we always do. We're just going to take the auto siphon, put it in here, put the other end lower in the destination vessel, and get it started. Now there's a lot of solids in here, so I don't expect this to come out perfectly clear out of here, and that's okay. You this is the rack. first rack. But all the orange peel actually went to the bottom. Derek was worried about that, um, and honestly, that's always a concern. If it stays at the top, it could mold in contact with air, but it all dropped just in the last few days, actually. I'm going to put this all the way to the bottom and get as much fluid out as we can. Okay, couple things. First, this did not clear, like, at all. This was started 9-14, so we're already, like, six weeks on this. Four, well, four weeks. Four weeks. It should be a little bit clearer than that, and I know oranges have tons of pectin, so we are going to add a little bit of pectic enzyme. This is an optional ingredient. I mean, you don't have to. Um, clarity isn't the utmost. We always say that. That's why it's kind of ironic that we're actually starting to worry about clearing, but, you know, this is really hazy. And mostly it's because we've had so many people ask us about it. We wanted to be to be more familiar with these products so that way we could give honest answers. Yeah, and that way we can show you what it does and you can make the make your mind up for yourself if you want Yes. If you want to use it. So the package says half a teaspoon per US gallon of juice, or use double that after fermentation. So we are after fermentation. I don't quite have a gallon of juice, so I'm not gonna use a full teaspoon. I'm going to use like three quarters of a teaspoon because I have about three quarters of a gallon. And I'm just going to dump it right in. It's like the most complicated thing to use. 
That's called sarcasm. I'm gonna mix that up. So now we have our mead that is flavored with the orange peel and it has some pectic enzyme in there. And then when we were making this, we had all the fruits from those peels that we didn't use. Now, I'm gonna guess, you know what, let me, let me use the calculator the teacher said I would never have handy to figure out what our ABV is right now. So we start at 1.120 and it ended at 1.006. That gives us 0.114 for gravity used times 135 gives us 15.3%. Okay, so with 15.3%, I don't think it's really gonna ferment much more at all. So we're just gonna put these in. If it does ferment further, that's totally okay. We can always sweeten this later. We can always make adjustments as it goes. So- But we also took a gravity reading so we know what gravity is at it is at now. Right. So we can take another one later on down the road and know exactly what happened or didn't happen. Now these fruits were frozen and only partially thawed. They're not totally thawed. And I'm just breaking them into sort of pieces, not really full sections because they were frozen. So the uh, yeast, since they are microscopic, they will get there. A lot of people are always asking, oh, shouldn't I blend that up? Should we juice that? Well, you can if you really want to. It's not actually, whoops, necessary because like I said, yeast are microscopic. They'll get in there. Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, I thought when we added all the fruit in that we would end up closer to like up here. But you know, we have a huge discrepancy here. That's a lot of headspace. Makes me a little bit uncomfortable because if you have too much headspace, you can get off flavors from oxidation. You can even have it turn to vinegar, though in this case, it's over 15%. It's not gonna be vinegar, but we don't want any oxidation or off flavors to occur. So we got out a regular one gallon wide mouth and we're going to transfer it from this to this. Be back in a minute. Okay. As you can tell, we chose wisely this time. There's like almost no headroom. It's like really that far from the lip. And I'm going to put my... Where are you putting on the top? Or I'm gonna the... put it on the lid. Okay, because it's... It's moist. It's moist. Does that word bother anybody? Moist? Moist. Does the word moist, moist bother you? If it bothers you, let me know in the comments. If it doesn't bother you, let me know in the comments. I'm sure there's gonna be some people that really go nuts about this. I just have to go like right there. Yeah. What are we gonna do with this now? Gonna let it sit. Probably a few weeks. I want some of the fruit to extract into the meat itself, and I wanna give it a chance to clear. So we'll see you when it's done more of that. It's been two weeks, and when we left this last, it was at 1.006 final gravity. We're calling that final gravity because it lasted twice. And we added a bunch of fruit. Now today, I wanna just do another quick final gravity, just because we did add some fruit to it, make sure that everything's good. You know, do a final check smells kind of like mandarin orange mead. Okay, this is an interesting thing. It went up to 1.010. So some of the sugars from the fruit got into the brew and they did raise the gravity ever so slightly. But the fact that it didn't keep going, it didn't go to dry, means it really was done. So let's uh, pour this into a pitcher and be ready for the next phase, which is gonna be Racking. Now before we rack, I just want you to look at this. Look at how beautiful this. Do you see how clear? Let me let me get my cell phone it's, and put a light behind it's it. It's gorgeous. It's a thing of beauty and the color is so lovely. How's that? There you go. It's, I think you can see that. It's totally clear. Yeah. It's actually orange mead. It's beautiful. Very, very clear. This is one of the more clear products we've made in quite some time. Yep. And that's, you know, we did add some pectic enzyme. So that's, that's what did it. Um, and sometimes, you know, you just gotta do what you gotta do. Now, would we have been bothered if this wasn't absolutely crystal clear? No, of course not. I don't think it affects flavor until you get to like, you know, if it's like pea soup consistency, that's something to be considerate of. But, you know, a little haze, it's not that big of a deal. But we are going to rack this off that fruit, get it into a pitcher, pull out as much as we can without sucking up too much of the uh, stuff at the bottom. But before we bottle this, we have to do our final tasting and that, we, we call it the final tasting, but it's really not because we do one in a year too. And this is just to, what? So we had this big discussion that didn't really work out well because words, they're complicated, right? But basically we went really on the conservative side because we were trying yeah. to keep this as clear as possible because we don't know what it tastes like. But right. Now, but now we're gonna find out. So clarity, we lost some in the racking process. Ideally, you want to rack this to another 
carboy, let it sit for a while, and then bottle. We may end up doing that. To me, it smells strongly of alcohol. Yeah, what is the ABV of this one? Do we know? We Have we figured know. it out? Let me do that <laughs> using the calculator that just happened to be right here. The teacher said I would never have handy. So I just put some paper towel over our pitcher just, just in case, just to make sure nobody gets in there because I don't want to mess this up. Right. So, essentially, it's going to be a little bit of an estimation, simply because we don't know if any of the mandarin fruit that went in actually fermented, though I don't think so. 13 fruits probably wouldn't be much more sugar than the four points that it added, so I don't think any of that fermented at all, but we're going to be within like, you know, half a point or so. Uh, so we started with 1.120. We ended at 1.0. 006. Very, very simple. That means we used 0.114, or 114 points. Multiply that by 135, and you get 15.39% ABV. No wonder why she's tasting some, or smelling some Smelling's, alcohol, because yeah. this is pretty decently high alcohol. Let me, let me take a note. 15.4%. That's what I'm calling it, because that 0.1, you know, come on. Anyway, so... So I do get a bit of the orange, but it, yeah. it smells more like an orange liqueur to me. It really does. It smells kind of like Cointreau. It really does. It smells a little bit like Cointreau, almost like we intended it to. One of us did. I don't know if she knew that's what I was making for her, but, you know. I, I did not. And I believe Cointreau is made with, like, uh, a combination of dark orange. Like, yeah. You know. I wanted mandarin, so we did mandarin. They're easy to peel. Okay, initial impression, it's sweet enough. I don't think it needs any sweetener. Yeah. That 1.010 final gravity is actually kind of nice. Let me, oh, I forgot to take a note on that. I am getting some of that tart, astringent, bitter yeah. aftertaste that, that I often get when drinking unintentional fermented orange juice. Yeah. And, and you, you are very sensitive to that. And I'm very that. sensitive to that, and, and it, it doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> okay. I'm getting it too, but I'm going to attribute that to this being a little bit on the young side. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's out of balance. I think the acid level is just right. Mm -hmm. I think it's got a nice mouthfeel. It's, it's got some viscosity to mm -hmm. it. And I think the sweetness level is good. So to me, everything's in balance. There's yeah. nothing we can do to change it. It's going to be a case of... Is this going to be just a successful brew combination or not? Right now, it's okay. It's not, it, it wouldn't be my favorite thing ever, but it's okay. Yeah, I want- I think time is gonna help. I it. think time is definitely gonna help. Uh, of course, this is just a base line, right? So if you wanted to go crazy with it, you could add so many things to this. You could oh, sure. spice it, yeah. you could oak it, you could spice it and oak it. Just don't add chocolate to it, because chocolate and orange is just weird. I'm That's sorry to all you people that love those chocolate orange things. That is just odd and strange and wrong. For us. For yeah. You, for you, it might be wonderful. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> um, I, want, I want some more. I could, I could even see adding different fruits to it, like the mango or... Mango or apricot would both yeah. work really well with this. Maybe even peach. But that said, I think for this particular beverage, I want to leave it as is. I don't want to add... Whoops. See, he wasn't as delicate. Yeah, I, I'm not delicate. <laughs> I think we've established that fact. <laughs> I don't think I want to add anything to it. I want to see what the age does to this. I'm really... You know, when is our TARDIS coming in? Because we, that would be very useful. To right be able to jump now. ahead a year and then come back? Right. Yeah. Because we'd be like, okay, let's see what this tastes like in a year. Or we could jump back a year and make it then and then oh, you know, today. Yeah. Either way would work. I'm ready to put a number on this because we're at that point in the video where we do numbers. Now, the way our numbering system works is this. One means it's absolute crap. Ten means it's absolutely amazing and probably the thing you'd reach for first. Unless it's an 11, in which case that's like the very few things that would go before a 10. Five is kind of like my breaking point. If it's below a five, I'm probably going to debate whether I really want to have a drink that day. Five or above, if that was all I had, I would drink it. Before I do that, let me take you through... Oh, take you on a trip. The flavors, yeah. As it enters, it definitely has a little bit of orange to it. Um, kind of a florally orange, uh, that, that definitely like a citrus blossom, which is the honey. A little bit of sweetness, but not too much. In the mid-mouth, 
okay, as it's traveling in, that's when the viscosity starts to kick in. And that's when a little bit of the alcohol bitterness kind of comes through, and you do taste a little bit more alcohol than I really want. It's a little stronger that way than I really want. The orange flavor is still there, but it's kind of like she said, almost like a liqueur, uh, a sweeter orange than you would expect. On the finish, that bitterness is still there, and it kind of takes away from the experience. So I think we're getting a very strong alcohol flavor in this, and the orange, because it's still young, hasn't melded well with that. It's not bad, don't get me wrong. I could probably drink this as it is. It's not really her thing, I think, but I, I don't think it's too bad. Okay. Are Numbers. you ready? Yeah. One, two, three, six. Three. Whoa, three. Oh boy. All right, you're low. What, what, three. I, it's not It's not my thing. All right. Here, swap glasses then. <laughs> but I want to, I, I can't pinpoint, so don't drink it at all, please. I can't pinpoint, fair enough. I can't <laughs> pinpoint what I don't like about it other than it tastes like fermented. Yeah, see, you grew up with the, the rotten orange thing. Yeah. And that's going to stick with you. There's not much you can do about that. All right, that. so for science, I would like you to, if you can, grab the bottle of Contro. Of course. I saw this coming. Oh, you probably want a little more, don't you? I don't want... Oh, you're going to do a side-by-side. -side. Yes. Well, I can tell you that the Cointreau is going to be sweeter and probably more viscous. And it's less orange. Just going to do a little bit. Well, For some reason, I always thought it was orange. No, it's because of the orange bottle. It, it fools you. Yeah. It's an orange liqueur. It's an orange bottle. It's got an orange cap. It's got an orange label. It's not orange. It's clear. My impression on the smell, right away, is the Cointreau has more of that like the pithy navel orange smell. Oh yeah. Whereas this is definitely a sweeter orange. Distinctly different though. I mean, they don't, they don't smell the same at all. This. This, the, what's this? The, the Cointreau smells like when you're peeling an orange and that psh, you That's know, what I mean, the pithy. That's what it smells like and it's lovely. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I could just smell that forever. Where this, our brew, smells, it's got the funk. Now, like we've said multiple times, that could simply be its youth because that is what the youth brews smell like. Yeah. Now I gotta say something. Honestly, Cointreau is a distilled product. It's a whole different animal. But that stuff is really good straight. Mm. I could drink that straight. Mm. It's got a warming property to it that's just really, really nice. I am curious though. We have to do it. I'm, I'm promoting this idea this time. I think... It's the orange with the syrupy sweet combo of Cointreau mm -hmm. that makes it work for me where just straight up fermented orange doesn't. You need your orange to be very sweet. I need my orange to be sweet. I need you saw what I did there, right? Fresh. It was yeah, like a, that an was like ounce. A, a minuscule it, amount. It was like an ounce of mead with like five drops of Cointreau changed it distinctly. Now I still have Cointreau tongue going on right mm -hmm. now. You want add a little bit more Cointreau. Okay. Here, there you go. Now it's probably about like a three Cointreau to one, or okay. no, I'm sorry, one Cointreau to three me. Look at me, I'm swirling. Whoa, get some speed. Build up speed. Yeah. Look at you. And, and you messed, and it, I up. messed yeah. it all up. All right, just, just drink it. <laughs> it makes it less syrupy uh, like Cointreau. But it definitely brings up the... It smells uh, better, it tastes better. I mean, the funk is still there, it's just definitely hidden. Oh, yeah. oh, that's immensely better. Yeah. Okay, so final judgment on this, though, is it's ready to be bottled, all right? Yeah. Um, we may actually let this sit for a couple more days. Like, we might put it back into a fermenter and let it sit for a couple days to clear out some more, then bottle it. Uh, but we've done bottling in other videos. You guys have seen it. So we're going to end this video right here. So as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.